So David, are you ready? Are you ready to start? Huh. All right. So give me just a second. Okay. Well, hello everybody. Welcome to this month's co colloquium. We are lucky to have David Gayote. We'll talk about twisted holography and the uh, etouffed expansion of VOAs. Um, if you have a question, just feel free to interrupt in the middle. Okay, okay. thanks. So indeed, so this talk is about um, twisted holography, meaning, uh, but in a sense, about also examples which are not twisting of holography, in a sense that there is a general idea that you have holographic, <clears throat> holographic correspondences for supersymmetric theories. You can look at some protected subsectors of these and derive simpler holographic correspondences involving maybe some chiral algebras on one side and some topological demodel on the other side. But in a sense, I would like to analyze things in a way that doesn't refer to an underlying physical theory and potentially look at examples which do not come from the twist of some uh, of some four-dimensional quantum field theory. So uh, I'd like to see how much uh, how much can I push the experience acquired from twisted holography to discuss the tooth expansion of very general examples of vertex algebras which admit a large n expansion. And I would like to see if I can sort of discover uh, very exotic examples uh, of, of holography this way. So, and right, so with large expansion of UAs, I really mean that I have some vertex algebras which are defined in terms of fields, which are n by n matrices, uh, perhaps gauged by the gamma systems. And I want to study these vertex algebras in the, in the tooth expansion, a large n limit. So, okay. Now, the, this sort of circle of ideas started with uh, the original work by Kopakumar Vafa, which uh, suggested that one can uh, use the geometric transition in the B model to relate uh, the volunteer of some two dimensional brains to uh, string theory on a, on a deformed, on a, on a deformed conifold. Then uh, with, with Kevin, we, we worked out some precise holographic dictionary. So make it clear that this was just an example, a stand, you know, a standard example of holography. Uh, later on, I did some work with uh, my student Paja, uh, where we studied certain correlation functions of determinant operators in the Kerala algebras, and then uh, expressed the answer in terms of holomorphic curves in the dual geometry. And what I found really striking, both in the work with Kevin and the work with Kaja, is that the geometry of the holographic dual was emerging from just large n combinatorics without any, uh, without any, anything else. I mean, with this twisted theory, the coupling is almost uh, not there. Everything is combinatorics. Uh, and so later on, I, sh I should mention also some nice work by, uh, by Keju Zeng, which uh, pushed the, the tooth expansion of OPEs further, which was also an inspiration for this. And uh, uh, there is some general, some ongoing work, which hopefully will come out in a, in, in a bit, which concerns uh, very general, these very general examples of, uh, of dualities. You now with Kevin, we sort of looked at the simplest possible case of a large N vertex algebra versus uh, the model. And in this ongoing work, we try to really study the most general vertex algebra with this structure that we can think of. Now, before I begin, I would like to remind you of uh, a general principle, you know, one of the most important lessons of string theory, which is open-closed duality. Open-closed duality is sort of the ancestor of holography, in the sense that all most of the holographic dualities that we know come from limits of uh, open-closed duality. Open-closed duality is the statement that you can take a theory of open strings and closed strings, uh, where the open strings are supported on a large number of D-brains, many copies of a single brain. And you can do the tooth expansion of this. You can take the string theory perturbative expansion and organize it, grouping together all the terms which differ only by the number of boundaries. 
and this within each group, the sum is supposed to be convergent and to be the same as just purely closed string theory amplitudes on some deformed background where you have replaced the deep brains by some geometry from some back reaction. And as I mentioned, the standard example of holography are der derived by taking some careful limit of a statement like this, where the left hand side becomes a string a field theory instead of a string theory, and the right hand side becomes a simpler closed uh, close string theory. Uh, now, open closed duality is intuitively reasonable, but hard to actually prove. We don't know how to prove. Of course, if we could prove open closed duality, then we would de derive all examples of holographies as a corollary. Um, but it also has the feeling of something that should be provable, because at the end it's just manipulations of this, you know, the integrants of string theory, uh, in a sense. Manipulate should follow from some group sheet manipulations. Anything for, for Gopokov and Waffa tried to give examples of these sort of manipulations uh, long ago. And there are situations in which we can prove the proof close open close duality. Some very specific examples of, string, of very simple string theories, where, which are essentially the ones that give rise to matrix models. So for matrix models, we kind of know how to, we know a lot about matrix models, and we also know how to express matrix model statements as a form of open close duality. Uh, and my medium term goal here is to try to do the same for these Karal algebra uh, distotolography examples. I would really like to be able to formulate them and formulate these distotolography statements and prove them uh, in a mathematically rigorous way. At least I would like to formulate them and somebody else to prove them in a mathematically rigorous way uh, using just the worksheet theory and its properties. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So, was there a question? Uh, okay. So, the setting of uh, where Karal algebra has emerged naturally is that of the B model, the B C V theory, B model topological strings. The idea is to take topological strings on a three, three dimensional Calabial geometry of the form C times X to D which X is a two-dimensional Calabial. Now, in the examples we studied with Kevin and, and Kaja, X might have been C2. Uh, there are a simple generalization is to take C, a normal fold of C2. But in, in general, we might be dealing with some completely non-geometric version of a Calabial cone described perhaps as some kind of Calabial category with some constraints. And in this setting, we take brains that wrap the whole of C and sit at a point in X. Typically, this will be the tip of X, if it's X is a cone, but sometimes you might want to move them away from the, from the tip. And because the B model is an holomorphic theory in target space, then the word sheet theory of these T brains is naturally a Karl theory in two dimensions, which is a Karl algebra. So for every choice of this internal space X, you're going to get some specific volume theory, which is a vertex algebra. And the open close duality statement is that this Karal algebra will be holographic dual to some calculations done in a back reacted Calabial geometry, where we take this C times X and we, we modify it to something else, to some Y. Uh, and calculations are matched by some very specific holographic dictionary. Davide, can I ask a quick question? Sure. And maybe this is also partly um, for KU too, since I think he's in the audience. But in, in this setup, it looks like it might be very amenable to using the uh, generalization of Lodi, Quill, and Siegen um, for yes, Calabias yes, yes. that have. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Okay. So Thanks. I will. Uh, I will indeed discuss how. See, it, my my whole goal is to be able to make statements which are not really dependent on the specifics of X. And yes. Uh, I will illustrate how, at the linear order in the tooth coupling, the, the duality is just a very familiar pairing between topological strings in C times X and, uh, and the probability of the brains. And then I want to learn how to deform this by turning off on and on trivial tooth coupling. But remaining, 
at all steps as algebraic as I can. So I would like to sort of make statements in in a, in a homotopical algebra that don't require one to understand Kodaka's tensor theory, this theory, in order to be proven. So, right, in the in the sort of work I did with Kevin and then with Kaja, this three-dimensional manifold and these properties, as I was mentioning, emerged from very simple combinatorics. Uh, we might not be able, we didn't know how to put the whole correspondence to combinatorics, but some aspects of them are, are very algebraic. For example, vector fields and functions on, on this 3D geometry can be derived just by studying the OP carefully in the dual Karl algebra. Uh, similarly, you can study these determinant correlation functions in the Karl algebra, and you see brains in Y3D emerge naturally. They, like Things like the ADHM construction for brains in, in Y emerge naturally from large and analysis of these correlation functions. And you know, when we're working in individual examples, uh, each individual example requires some amount of labor, some amount of work. And there were these different ways of getting the geometry, the dual geometry. And at the end, everything works. The different ways give you the same answer and you get consistent things. Um, and many of the intermediate steps can be applied to very general Karal algebra, which don't necessarily come from uh, these non-examples. And so you start really wondering, you know, how much of this can I, can I, can I push? Can I take a random Karal algebra with a large N structure and apply these methods to find uh, uh, the relevant Klaviaus and then formally formulate the duality in a holography, in a holography, holography statement uh, based on these probes. But right, as I was saying, some of this calculation could be done combinatorically. Some other require heavy duty Kodara Spencer calculations, victim diagrams, and whatever uh, Calabria geometry you have. And those seem to be harder to generalize or consider abstractly, especially if these Calabria are replaced by non geometric objects. So, um, first of all, I would like to describe to you the Karal algebra, which emerges from a generic X. Okay. So, as I said, I have some brains supported on C, and which do something in the internal space. They're com compact point-like brains in this internal space X to D. Uh, a brain in, in string theory is just a choice of boundary condition for the worksheet, for the worksheet theory. So given the worksheet theory on X to D, uh, I have some boundary condition and I have some properties of the boundary condition. And these properties must have somehow give me the volume theory of the D brain. And I would like to illustrate to you how this happens in this particular example. So in this particular example, you have an algebra of local operators that leave at the boundary of uh, at this boundary condition. Uh, this is an algebra with some extra structures. It's like a Chuda Chu Chu Calabria algebra, perhaps an infinity algebra. So in the examples I'm looking at, it's just an algebra. And uh, this algebra, the data of this algebra is captured by things like disk correlation functions. So in particular, the two point function, the two point function, and disk. And for every local operator on the boundary, I get a field in this in the volume theory. The volume theory of the Librens is literally a string field theory, an open string field theory. These words might make sense to some of you, not all of you, so I don't want to stress them too much. But for every local operator on the boundary, I get a field. And then the capping, so these fields are controlled by the, by the disk correlation functions. And so there is a kinetic term, like a phi delta phi, and then what looks like an interaction, a phi cube interaction. I included some ellipses here in case your algebra was an infinity algebra, but I would never need it in an example. So I'll look at. But although this looks like an interactive, interacting theory, this action I'm writing down is actually the, the BV action. If you unpack it, separate out fields, anti-fields, uh, gauge fields, ghosts, anti-ghosts, whatnot, uh, the final result is, much, is, is simpler than this. It's actually a free Karal algebra with some BRST differential, which is not trivial. Uh, 
so so perhaps I should anticipate that. So I had some fields with some very simple OPs and uh, which are just the ones. Oh, that could, I, could I could I make sure I understand what you just said? So yes. so capital phi includes the fit the the anti fields in a BV formalism. Yes, 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 that's right. That's right. So this okay. is a, like a, it's a standard string field theory. You write your this the open string field theory action is a BV action. And then, if you look at the fields of this number or some of those number, you can, you know, you can identify what what are fields and what are anti fields, and some the cubic term turns out to only deform the BNST differential rather than actually changing the action. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to get into details of the BV formalism, but right. So this action just describes a free beta gamma system with some non-trivial BNST differential. Which I'll describe on the target. This is obviously this was a very important simplifying feature. Like as long as you understand the BRST cohomology, all the calculations you do are just calculations of safety theory. This obviously helps. Uh, there was a little aside I wanted to, to take before I continue, which is that I think I probably switched the order of two slides at some point by mistake. Uh, which is that. Although I'm doing, I'm doing a discussion based on C times X, um, which sort of is naturally leads to things like correlation functions that are algebra on C times on C, or OPEs that put the, the algebra on C. Uh, usually, when you study Karel algebra, so you're from your this the first thing you do is to study correlation functions on CP one, which are like correlation functions on C with a very specific conformal invariant vacuum. Uh, you don't have to do that. There is a fun story about uh, correlation functions on the plane with non-trivial uh, with vacuum which break of formal symmetry. But ignoring that for the moment, uh, it's very easy to to set up the problem in such a way that you have a CP one to start with. So you can sort of fiber your cone over CP one in a way that is sort of like a conifold. You get a geometry which sort of is a manifest as you see global symmetry, which becomes the global conformal symmetry of the Carabra. Uh, and you can wrap your brains on CP1 uh, at the tip of this cone. But anyway, this is just an aside. Uh, this is sort of the setting that that Nagarf uh, and Wafa were discussing originally. They had a conifold, they were wrapping brains on CP1, and then they were doing a geometric transition to the deformed conifold. Uh, okay, so. so uh, oh, sorry, can I ask just a quick clarification yes. question on that slide? So, in these two different setups, sort of the conformal or the non conformal setup, can mm -hmm. the chiral algebras then give kind of two associated varieties associated to the Higgs and Coulomb uh, branches? It, it, it's the same chiral algebra. When you oh. work on C1, you just get correlation functions. When you work on C, you can get a space of vacuum. Okay. Uh, and then this space of vacuum is indeed the associated variety of the chiral algebra. Okay, thanks. So, for every point in the associated variety, you can study correlation functions. And dually, there will be a family of uh, three-dimensional Calabrian geometries where I've back-reacted the brains in different locations. Uh, this, the three Calabrian geometries will be more complicated, but they'll have the same boundary as the original one. So there will still be an holographic dictionary that works. You can still study the, this polymorphic functions and global vector fields I was discussing, the determinant correlation functions. Um, it's an interesting the formation of the story. Okay, so how does the Kralaj look like? As I said, it's a beta gamma system, three beta gamma system, or BC system, depending on the uh, class one parity of the fields. You have phi i and phi b, the OP is just one of, you know, phi of z, phi of w, as OP that goes like one of z minus w. I put an h bar in front for convenience, to do the expansion in a, in a more elegant way. And um, there is a pairing, is it AD, AD, which comes from the original pairing on the, is the inverse of the pairing on the algebra. And you take this theory and you turn on a BRST differential on it, associated to this BRST current, which is cubic in the fields, and again, involves the disk treatment function as a coefficient. And everything is done with three with contractions. Uh, for example, the, the BRST differential is obtained by 
the gate and the BRST current around the, the local operator. And when you do this with this integral, you get two contributions. One has one with contraction, one has two. And so you get a, a three level and one loop uh, contribution to the differential. Now, we want to do a large an expansion, a tooth expansion, which means that we only keep planar with contractions. And so every 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 contraction gives a factor of h bar. Every you know every loop, every phase in your tooth expansion gives a factor of n, and you can just keep a fixed tooth clapping lambda h bar n, and send n to infinity of h bar to zero. When you do that, for example. Right. you get a lot of simplifications. The crucial simplification is that you can work with single trace operators, meaning both the differential and the OPEs close on single trace operators. Uh, your typical single trace operator is going to be a trace of a collect product of fields and their derivatives. So you take a bunch of fields, you take their derivatives, you multiply them and take the trace. Remember, these are n by n matrices. And any linear, before I turn on the differential, any linear combination of these traces will be a valid thing to study. So here, what's mathematically, right? You take these fields are valued in the algebra. To keep track of derivatives, you add polynomials in a variable Z. Then you take N of them, and you project on cyclic invariant expressions because trace of AB is the same as trace of BA. About Lugasman parity issues. When you turn on the differential, the, the three level part gives you something of order one. And the one loop part gives you something of order h bar times n plus uh, some leading corrections. So you still get the three level and one loop contribution. And the one loop contribution is proportional to the tooth coupling. Basically, q0 takes a symbol and replaces it with two consecutive symbols. And Q1 takes two consecutive symbols and merges them into single in a single one. Now, if you allow me to ignore Q1, meaning to work at lambda equal to zero, then Q0 is a very familiar differential. It's a differential which defines cyclic homology of the algebra A of Z. This is what uh, Natalie was referring to, and it's an expression of causal duality, which I will come back to uh, momentarily. Uh, which is next slide. So, but I wanted to also discuss OPs. So again, as I said, the OP close on single trace operators. If you take two single trace operators, which are represented here by some cyclic sequences of symbols, uh, you when you compute the OP, you just do you know one with contractions, two with contractions, three with contractions, and so on, and you get something of order one or the lambda or the lambda squared, and so on, plus subleading. The subleading parts will involve multi traces, perhaps, but the leading part at large n is single trace, single trace goes to single trace. So you get a, a vertex algebra structure on these single traces. If, if you set lambda equal to zero, in particular, only, all the, only the first term survives, and you get a vertex algebra structure on this cyclic homology. And because duality is the statement that the cyclic homology naturally pairs with the closed string fields in the background in the, in, the, in the underlying geometry. So these brains are brains in C times X to D, and they couple to the closed string fields in, X, in C times X. And they couple linearly. Every single trace operator can be coupled to a closed string field in a specific way. And there is a, a map you know, from the closed string fields into the uh, the pairing regular between the clustering fields and this sitting cohomology, which is canonical, and gives you this pairing. And this pairing uh, has to be Gange variant. This is not obvious in the sense that when you do, if you act on this pairing with on this coupling with the BXT transformation, uh, you get a classical anomaly because of the equations of motion for the bulk string theory. Because the motion tells you the Q beta is not zero, but Q beta is, is bilinear in betas. So if I act on this interaction with Q, I get beta beta times the one, the single trace term. There is another contribution to the anomaly that comes from two interaction terms uh, and is controlled by the OP. 
So Kusul Duality is the claim that this, you know, leading in Lambda OPE must agree in the appropriate sense with the bracket, with the classical, with the equations of motion of the closed string fields. And stated like that, it still feels likely miraculous, although it cannot be miraculous, right? It's just the consistent of string theory, consistency of string theory. And so there must be a way to sort of describe this in a purely algebraic way in terms of the algebra A and its properties. This is what I'd like to do next. Davina, what's the uh, central charge of this vertex operator algebra? Uh, the central charge is uh, um, something, some negative multiple of n squared. Negative multiple of n squared, OK. Um, See, the stress tensor has two legs. And when you do the stress tensor with itself, you're going to pick a lambda. Actually, sorry, I should say, I should say it's better. The central charge is proportional to lambda. So it comes from the second term. Right, the stress tensor, stress tensor going to the identity. Oh, OK, so the central, so there's a VOA structure when lambda equals 0 and when it's non-zero? Yes, yes. So there is, there is a use, the vertex of the structure for all lambdas. And the lambda equal to zero limit is determined by causal duality, or should it must agree with causal duality uh, with properties of x times c. And then we, we what we want to do is to show that when we turn on lambda, causal duality is deformed into a statement in, that involves the back reactor geometry. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there should be a lambda deformed causal duality statement which is, in a sense, uh, this twisted holography at the leading end, at the leading order in one of n squared. And even if it's a, just, even if it's, still, sorry, the, the planar limit is still something that we don't know how to prove and we want, we want to be able to prove. Then on top of that, we, of course, we want to prove that the, all the one over n corrections also agree. But before doing one over n corrections, we would like to at least match the planar limits. Um, so I I wanted to sort of um, have a little aside. So as you can sort of see visually, uh, at all stages in the calculation, you will have a certain number of combinatorics involving powers of Z, you know, for the OP. Uh, but the OP coefficients are always going to be sort of represented by some pictures. There are always going to be some some you know some elements in this uh, in this space of single trace operators contracted with some uh, uh, in the some pairings in the algebra and perhaps you know as I as I then try to rewrite it in terms, in terms of Q or cohomology classes I will also have features which involve the the the, uh, the structural constants of the algebra. And what I want to do is to take these pictures based on the algebra A and convert them into worksheets. And why can I do that? Well, if you have looked at topological strings, topological quantum field theory in the past, you might be familiar with the idea that in many situations, I can take a complicated worksheet and cut it into pieces and then reassemble the, the amplitude of this worksheet the correlation function of this complicated worksheet in terms of these individual pieces. Now, this, this works best if I cut along sort of finite dimensional places, meaning if I cut a worksheet into two, I will have to sum over a state of a space of intermediate states. And this sum might be very hard unless the space of intermediate states is finite dimensional. But if the situation is sufficient finite dimensional, then there is no obstruction in cutting a worksheet and assembling it from elementary pieces. And in particular, if my worksheet has at least a boundary, I can always cut it along strips so that I can construct everything in terms of two -point fun these two-point functions and three-point functions and this sort of open-closed vertex, which is a, you know, a bulk local operator and a boundary local operator on a disk. For example, if I want to have a two-point function on a disk, I can cut the disk in two, uh, as I as described in this picture. Uh, 
So, and this thing goes both ways, right? If I have a complicated picture involving the algebra, I can say, wait, this was secretly a worksheet. Or if I have a worksheet, I can chop it up into expressions involving the algebra. Uh, these things, like I said, they work very well when all the spaces are finite dimensional, like in condensed matter physics, right? You want to study anions on a complicated space time, and then you start cutting and pasting, and you do uh, something like um, um, zero construction. Here in this setting, this works as long as the spaces are not too big. Uh, now, this algebra A of Z that is underlying the vertex algebra is not small. I mean, uh, what we're doing here is essentially string field theory. And we're saying if the, if the theory is absolutely simple, string field theory is, is just a, an integral or in its Spaman diagrams of some integral. But we know that. For these brains, we have a Karal algebra, we have two dimensional theory, but integral of two dimensional theory. So when you try to invert the propagator, you're inverting a del bar, for example, and not inverting a matrix. But after you do all of your Karal algebra calculations, as you learn from uh, whatever textbook or conformative theory you, you, you learned to the Karal algebra zone, the final answer only has graphs built out of A, not A of Z. And so the coefficients of the OPE, the coefficient, the answer to correlation functions can be written as worksheet calculations in the theory of the, or, or, you know, not the theory that describes these transverse directions. So for example, the leading OPE is at the end computed by some worksheet that looks like a disk with two closed punctures. The beta beta term in the in the equations of motion of the closed string could also be expressed in these terms. As long as you know you need to do a bit of work, you need to take a Colar Spencer theory in C times X and try to have, to do the calculation in C by hand and write the answer in a way that is universal on X. But after you've done that, it will be a calculation, it will be expressed by a diagram in in, in the theory of, of this transfer space X. Uh, in order to but, lose, yes. Yeah, but what, what is T of X? T is a theory, is the 2D theory, worksheet theory that describes the motion of the strings in X. So what mathematical object? Is that a is that a good so It's a topological field theory. Oh, it's a topological field theory. Yes, it's a worksheet theory of string theory, always are always topological, right? Uh Mr. Stencil is always Q of something. Well, I see it's a cohomologically. The cohomological, okay. that's right, that's right. So this is a cohomological. It's a topological field theory of cohomological time. Okay, got it. The, the problem challenging. But sometimes, if you're even for a cohomological topological field theory, if some channels are small enough, you can do cutting. Now, it's it's possible that this might be a statement is channel dependent. For example, this disk which you, which, which you punctures, if I cut it on, if my Algebra, boundary algebra is small, I can cut it uh, as a sum over intermediate states in the boundary. It's possible that in this theory, the closed string theories were not small, meaning there were infinitely infinite many closed string states. So I wouldn't have been able to do the same algebraic cutting where I merged the two bar punctures into a sphere. Uh, so, right, so. It, on the on the bulk side, I might have to do some Colera Spencer calculations to, to 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 arrange things properly. But once I do that, I should be able to just express causal duality at the linear order in lambda, just as a statement that I'm computing the same diagram on the two. I, I, I do two calculations which result in the same diagram in the same worksheet amplitude uh, for this d of x. And now pushing this at higher order in lambda means trying to convince yourself of the same statements about uh, more complicated pictures. So again, the OPE coefficients in the Karal algebra can always be expressed as some classes integrated over the modelized space of Riemann surfaces with a certain number of boundaries and two punctures. Um, or three punctures, sorry, I should put an extra puncture here for the OPE or triple functions. Uh, but, um, the challenge is to show that 
that these that open closed duality can be applied, meaning that this expressions with a bunch of extra disks can be matched to a quadra Spencer calculation in a Bergerac geometry of the by order in lambda. If you can do that, then it will have shown that at least the genus zero uh, that you know a leading order in, in, in one over n this twist topography holds uh, in full generality. So I can try to do this calculation in a specific example, like C2, where X, X is C2 or C2 mod gamma. But in practice, you find that a lot of the calculations proceed in parallel. And so it seems pointless to do it example by example, and it feels more natural to just do it in full generality. So I would like to say these classes integrated on the model space of human surfaces with boundaries on this side, equal these other classes integrated on modal space of human surfaces without boundaries. Uh, you know, like a, a very a, a very complicated version of the sort of uh, calculation that Concierge did in matrix models, right? showing that some integrals over the integral of some classes on the on, on the modal space with boundaries were equal to integral some other classes in the modal space without boundaries. So I want to reduce it to some statement like that, a conjecture like that, at least, to one could hope to prove. Okay. So uh, right. So this was this slide was uh, again the statements of this this goal. I have the Karal algebra. I can compute OPEs and correlation functions, and I can express them as worksheets. On the other side, I have BCOV on some backrated geometry. I can compute OPEs using the bibliographic dictionary. And I can try to express it in terms of the theory on X. And if I can do so, I can now try to convince myself that the calculations are the same, are literally the same. Now, Codera Spencer theory is hard, you know, with the diagrams, uh, Farman diagrams, Codera Spencer theory are unpleasant to compute, although they can be done. Okay, Kedru has some beautiful examples in his paper, um, where he computes some of the subleading terms from the OPE and compares them with the uh, with sort of Farman diagrams in Codera Spencer theory for the simplest example. Um, with, um, there are some quantities which can be computed without using these Farman diagrams, and which uh, we introduced it uh, with Kevin and with Kaja. And I would like to discuss those for, for, the, for the next uh, 15 minutes or so. So one of, the, one of these tools is the global symmetry algebra of the, of the problem. So as I said, the planar of E is linear. Uh, Sorry, I, I didn't mention, I don't know why about this. I meant it's linear in the single trace operators. It's a, it takes two single trace operators and spits out a single trace operator. So this is like, so normally vertex algebras could be way more complicated, right? You could have the OP of two things being a polynomial in the generators. Uh, but here I have a bunch of generators and the OP uh, is linear. Which, which means that the vertex algebra associated to them, to this scale algebra, is a Lie algebra, it's like uh, via Virasov or Katsmudi, just with many more generators, as opposed to being a W algebra. Um, now, for which, so when I say vertex algebra, I mean that for every local operator in the scale algebra, I can expand the local operator in a, in a collection of modes, and this defines a vertex algebra. In particular, the most for which for n that is not too big and not too small annihilate both the vacuum at infinity and the vacuum at the origin. So if you have a correlation function on CP1, uh, these modes give you a symmetry. You can sort of say, okay, I I take this mode, the sum over all possible ways to act the mode on the local operators on my sphere is zero. I get word identities, so I get the symmetry. For example, the stress tensor has three modes in this range. 
you know, from minus two, from minus one to one. And these three modes are just the generators of the global S2 symmetry rotating CP1. In general, if I have a, a current of spin D minus of, of dimension D, I'm going to get a, a multiplet of modes, which is a D minus, by D minus one dimensional, a spin D minus one uh, representation of this global S2C. So if I have an operator of spin one, or dimension one, that's a current, a zero mode of the current, uh, survives and it's a singlet under S2. If I have a operator dimension three halves, I'm gonna get a mode modes including one half minus one half that form a doublet of S2, and so on and so forth. So I can compute this global symmetry algebra, the structure constant of this global symmetry algebra from this OPE calculation, just picking the correct powers of one over Z. And the claim with Kevin is that, and the work with Kevin is that this uh, global symmetry algebra has to match holomorph global holomorphic vector fields on the backyard geometry. In particular, if you set lambda equal to zero, you're supposed to recover holomorphic vector fields on this X fiber over CP1. And when you turn on the tooth coupling, you're supposed to see vector fields on the full geometry. And I want to stress again, this, this structural constant of this global symmetry algebra are just worksheet calculations for this D of X to D. So it's just a, it's a recipe. You get, you, you give me your true topological field theory, you get with the brain and you get a global symmetry algebra. The, the combinatorial machinery is theory independent. But the algebra, of course, will depend on the theory. Uh, and I think this is important because this global symmetry algebra has a chance to determine the OP completely. And so it, it, it organizes all the fields into a representation of this gigantic algebra. And so it offers a chance to sort of bypass BCOV calculations. You can say, okay, I do a calculation BCOV, whatever the calculation was, it has a symmetry, which is all in vector fields. And if the symmetry is big enough to fix the answer, well, I don't even need to do the calculation. Uh, now, vector fields are still perhaps not something that you can immediately use to determine. Okay, I assume that knowing vector fields on, a, on this manifold will tell you what the manifold is, but it might be difficult to, to read it. Um, there is a modification which is very useful, which is to add, to look at mesons. So to add fundamental matter to the Carroll algebra, add fields which are some as a fundamental or anti-fundamental of UN. Um, you can ask, you know, what sort of data that involves? How would I get something like that? Well, if you have some other brain, uh, like a space filling brain, you can look at three-point functions, which are sort of, uh, disks, which have part of the boundary corresponding to the original brains and part of the boundary corresponding to the new probe brain. And this will give you the correct coefficients to introduce the, the fundamental fields in the Lagrangian. So algebraically, these, these, these extra brains give you like uh, modules, left and right modules for this algebra A. And uh, you get fields valued in these modules. And out of these fields, you can start making mesons we take a fund an anti-fundamental, a bunch of adjoints, and a fundamental. And uh, if you look at the leading order in lambda, the space of the homology of mesons is the same as the tensor product of the two modules. So this is like a, a, a the, the version of this statement uh, that you get uh, cyclic homology for closed traces. For for mesons, you get tensor products. And again, there will be a loop correction as you turn on lambda. And the OPE of mesons and closed traces, clo a traces give you mesons at the leading order in, in N. And the OPE of two mesons give you also a meson. So it's like uh, you are extending your original vertex algebra by extra mode, extra operators, which uh, form a module for the original algebra. And 
all the, the OPE coefficients all the, are all associated to, again, to worksheet calculations with, with these extra planes. And now these mesons also give you a contribution to the global symmetry algebra. And this matches, is supposed to match functions instead of vector fields. So this allows you to sort of recover functions on, on, uh, on your well, geometry, which pretty much means giving you the geometry. For example, with Kevin, we could reconstruct the deformed conifold by looking at these algebra functions. Uh, here in this slide, I'm just commenting a little bit on what the back reaction looks like. So I, I kept, I've been talking for a while about, you know, I have this X times C and I back react it to Y to D. What does it mean in practice? So if you wrap brains on C at the tip of X, uh, the back reaction looks like this. It's a, it's a Beltrami differential. It changes the, the geometry, the complex geometry. It has the vector is along the Z direction and the one form part is along the X direction. So you can think about this as sort of, you're taking the Z plane and fibrating, fibering it in an anterior way over X. And a little BC of a theory, this thing essentially is modifying the differential. Whatever was the, you know, the condition for a function to be holomorphic, for example, now it's modified because the function now has to be cubed by del bar plus uh, the action detected of this time differential on the function. And you can try to write new functions, you know, starting from functions in the old geometry, x times c, and correcting them uh, uh, systematically. You need to solve some kind of a descent relation to do so. And once you've done that, you can look at what the new algebra of functions is going to be. And this should give you the y3d. And um, what I would like to see is that this sort of systematic calculation of the algebra matches order by order in, in the tooth coupling, uh, in the back reaction, the OP calculations uh, for mesons. And same for the vector fields. Um, any questions before we move on? Um, yes, yeah, just a question to, to have a concrete uh, intuition. So the, the C gets fibered over um, X2, right, in yes. general. So what would be, the, in the case of the conifold, like what, what X2 would lead to the conifold after you do this back reaction? So that for the conifold, the back reaction is to the deformed conifold. Ah, okay, but... Could you get the conifold as a result of starting with C times some? X? No, so the conifold and C times X times, and C3 are pretty much almost the same manifold. Like, okay, the conifold is like C3 plus an extra uh, point, plus an extra, sorry, an extra plane. Uh, like, if you take the conifold, which is a vibration over, or, over CP1, and you replace CP1 with C, then you just mm -hmm. get C3. The back okay. reaction is more severe. It transforms the conifold to the form conifold. I see. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Yes. Uh, okay. All of these calculations in concrete examples can be done using check homology. So you never need to really solve differential, complicated differential equations. Uh, so, but I, I, and I've, I would like to know how to express these words in a way that don't make reference to the geometry of X at all. And I can say even non-geometrically. Uh, but I don't know how at the moment. Uh, right, giant gravitons. I wanted to discuss very briefly uh, giant gravitons. So until now I, dis I discussed uh, single trace operators and correlation functions of single trace operators. And as long as you look at operators which are made out of a finite number of fields, that's pretty much all you can get. In large and expansion, everything is single traces or polynomials in single traces. But you can also look at operators which are built with an order of n fields, like determinant of some expression which is linear in your fields. 
this will they expand out this determinant. This will have order and, and fields. And um, the general law is that these determinants correspond to adding from brains uh, in holography. So adding brains which reach the boundary at a point. Uh, in practice, the way you see this is by rewriting the determinant as a part integral of a certain auxiliary fermions. So you place some auxiliary fermions chi and psi at the, the origin, and you couple them to your fields at the origin. And when you integrate it with the fermions, they will give you a determinant. And these fermions transform in a fundamental representation or anti-fundamental representation of the gauge group at that point. And so you can see that if you do Feynman diagrams, you're going to get worksheets. You're, you're going to get Feynman diagrams with boundaries. You're going to get brains. Um, algebraically, in order to describe this determinant of operators, I again had to pick some kind of some A modules uh, associated with the brain that now lives at z equal to zero. And then you can again make a, an argument about what sort of modifications I can do to these determinants. You can discover open strings on this. Uh, on these brains and so on. With Kaja, with Kaja, we looked at coercion functions of a, of a collection of determinants. And we found a, a way to manipulate them using a certain Kabastratonovich Habast transformation uh, to get some explicit subtle equations. And solving these subtle equations gave us, sorry, yeah, the, the, we found that we could manipulate these subtle equations uh, into the form of an equation for a spectral curve in uh, in uh, in this x3 in this y3d meaning that we could really see that these determinants insert endpoints of a d brain the boundary that then and this then these endpoints are connected inside the bulk by some complicated geometry so you get a very non-trivial subtle equations that have to reproduce holomorphic curves in, in X in Y three D, which go to the boundary in a specific way. And again, it looked a bit miraculous that you could do so. And if you repeat the exercise in more general examples, you end up finding essentially what are what's an ADHM construction for these uh, brains extending into the bulk. And so this is another sort of thing that you could imagine doing for very general examples. For any large and caral algebra, you can say, okay, let me add fundamental fermions, try to make it in a, in a BRST invariant way. Uh, and study correlation functions. Uh, I can integrate away the phi fields the first, then I can do this Abbas-Tratonovich transformation and integrate away the fermions too. And I will always be left with some subtle equations and large n. And it begs the question, can I always massage these subtle equations in the form of the, an ADHM complex for some d brain in some uh, do well the ground. And yes, I mean, it looks like you can always do so. And again, this, this sort of begs for a careful, uh, for a careful dis algebraic discussion. So again, all the calculations are just calculations done using this algebra and these modules in complicated ways. And out come these subtle equations. And the subtle equations know about the back reaction from C times X to Y3D somehow. So I would really like to be able to have a, have a sort of a completely algebraic way to describe the deformation of C times X into this Y, which makes manifest that all of these calculations had to work. At, you know, at least at the leading order in lambda and then order by order in lambda. So that's the that's the goal of this project. So, right, what are the so right? So to say it again, I want an algebraic proof of at least parts of twisted holography for general Karal algebras. I want to do it in a way that is universal on the Karal algebras and on the Calabiar geometries, perhaps not even geometric. So I want to say, okay, I have a Karal algebra. I get a 2D Calabiar geometry out of that for free, and then there is a back reaction that I can deduce from doing OPEs or from doing determinant correlation functions, and this back reaction works, and it has to work. Um, 
if we can do that for this example, the same technology should work for a variety of other twisted uh, theories. For example, I see no reason it shouldn't work for all solomorphic twists of four-dimensional theories. I could do a similar thing. I can write it for the holomorphic twist. And indeed, we started doing it in some examples in, in some of the papers that we write. You can take an arbitrary holomorphic theory in situ. You can say this, the action for this holomorphic theory secretly knows about a three-dimensional Calabria cone. And now I can do another, I can try to perhaps not geometric. And then I can take a B model on C2 times Calabria 3 and back react it somehow. And, and I should be able to reproduce an holographic dual for the for this very abstract holomorphic theory on C2. And this should automatically recover, I don't know, the 16 BPS states for an equal four super meals or quarter BPS states in quiver. Uh, in quiver gauge theories and so on and so forth. Same the, the same general philosophy should, I think, work for a topological twist of 3D theories. Uh, ABGM, I would love to do this with ABGM, for example. And all of the gazillion 3D, that there are just so many homomorph uh, 3D transamon uh, theories. Uh, with n equal two, n equal three, or n equal four, or n equal six supersymmetry, we just beg to have some kind of holographic dual. We, of course, don't know how to do it for the physical theories, but at least at the level of the morphic topological twist, we might be able to do so. Uh, there are also algebras that can be obtained from 3D n equal four theories, which also have nice correlation functions, uh, which are important for the bootstrap program. And nice have a lot of interesting properties and should be amenable to this general analysis. So, and ultimately, I would love to do something like this for twister strings. My like twister strings are supposed to give you the dual the dual sector of n equal four super mills. So if you could really study the back reaction of you know, brains and crystal strings in the correct way, you might be, you might be able to find a holographic dual for the self-dual Yamil's theory in a systematic way. And then perhaps learn about, you know, that will give you pretty much an holographic dual for the integrand of the correlation of the correlation functions in the full theory. Because you can write the full theory as self-dual Yamil's plus uh, an insertion of Lagrangian densities. Anyway, so I, I I really want to use these Karal algebras as, as, a, as a testing ground to, to learn how to do algebraic holography uh, as, you know, and push it as far as possible. I'm done. Thank you very much. Are there Are there questions for Davide? I have one. Um, can you go back uh, briefly to the part where you were talking about reconstructing the world sheet? I think I, I, I just missed um, a part of that because we adopted a puppy and she was going kind of bonkers when you were explaining this part. So could you briefly uh, summarize um, the approach you were talking about again? Um, and I yes, wonder, so is it too trivial to do um, this sort of thing for like the Konsevich model, like do oh, no, an easy example of so, dual duality in this setting using like 2D topological gravity in the Konsevich model? Has, has, is that, would that be instructive? It's absolutely <laughs> not trivial, not, not too trivial. And indeed I had fun uh, as I was preparing this talk just to, as a, as a, as a sanity check. Uh, you can take the matrix model, the, the one matrix model, the Gauss matrix model, and you can write it as an open string field theory. And, uh, uh, you know, you can say, okay, it's an open string field theory for B brains in the Dagraf alpha uh, geometry. And then the back reaction gives me, well, the back reaction of the Dagraf alpha geometry, you can make contact with Dagraf alpha like that. Uh, then in the same geometry, you could look at space filling brains. And indeed, the, the conservative yeah. matrix model is supposed to, uh, to, to describe that. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So the concierge metrics model, at some point, I haven't tried to write a paper with Lonard about deriving concierge model from the open stream. It's an open stream. Yeah, that's why I thought you were the person to ask this. <laughs> yes, at the time, my my ability to say words about localization was not great. So I, I feel like we, we had it 99% you know, there, uh, but it could be done in a cleaner in a cleaner way. Um, yeah, I was also interested in that example. So, um, but also happy to talk more and give other people time for questions now. So, right. So every time your string field theory, open string field theory is right. Every time your the space of local operators can be is finite dimensional, then open string field theory is just an, an integral. Uh, you can do Feynman diagrams without any any much excessive stress and. Uh, and so yes, so you, you're gonna get some nice pictures with uh, vertices which are algebra structural constants and lines which are pairings of the algebra, and, and you can say, well, this is this this algebraic, but is also for sheet calculation. Thank you. Yes, Kurt. So um. Could we go back to that um, that uh, vertex oper the family of vertex operator algebras? I think you said it was uh, deforming the Hochschild cohomology of A of C. Ah, yes, yes. Uh, oh, there we are. Okay, right there. Yeah. Yes. So, um, what what can you say, or is it even interesting to ask uh, what about the um, category of modules? Is there a good category? First of all, is there a good category? So you have a family of vertex operator algebras yes. labeled by lambda. I think you said the central charge is proportional to lambda? Yes. Okay, so um, is there any reasonable category of modules for these vertex operator algebras? And do they have, would it have well, a physical interpretation? The meso, if, you, if you introduce fundamental matter, uh, then the mesons are, cut, are, are modules for the for the single trace operators. So this gives you a collection of modules. Is there any, I mean, you, sorry. Do they, is there any generalization of a modular tensor category here? Uh, I don't know if I can, if I know how to say something intelligent about tensor products. Yeah, you need to take a tensor product of these modules. Yeah, I don't know. And express it as another. Yeah. Some. Uh, some no, when the generalized sum of modules for the same vertex operator. Algebra. Determinants are also a way to get modules. Determinant mm -hmm. modifications. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I said modular tensor category, but just diffusion category already. Uh, would that have a physical interpretation? I mean, wouldn't that be some kind of. I mean, you're talking about OPEs of these. Yeah, especially these. for determinants, yes. So the determinants will give you modules for the full algebra, not just the large N one. Mm -hmm. uh, and you could think about the OP, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, something interesting is that, see, if you, if you sort of multiply the determinants, blindly ignoring weak contractions like with normal so in normal ordering in this kind of discussions are funny because there are two ways to, to multiply things you can say because they're freaker algebras you can say i do the normal order of the product or i do the op and then take the regular part of the op mm -hmm. the regular part of the op is nice because it satisfies Leibniz with the vrc differential but it's mm -hmm. not nice because it's not associative. On the other hand, the normal order is associative, but does not satisfy Leibniz. Uh -huh. but this gives rise to, to, to some interesting uh, phenomena. So for example, if I choose determinants, I try to multiply them to get a more complicated determinant. I get a, a secret, I get an extra anomaly, which I need to carefully uh, deal with. It was an important part in some calculations uh, we are doing. Um, which sort of has to do with the fact that you try, you know, you have, you have brains going to the boundary, you're trying to have two brains that go at the same place 
in the boundary, but when these brains come close to each other, there are open strings stretched between them, and you need to really uh, address that. But anyway. Sounds a little like a boundary amplitude, but but yes, I mean so the your models is rich. Uh, here's a related question. I mean, you know, if I if I think about Turn Simons for for a comp for a compact gauge group, yes, with uh, integer level, mm -hmm. positive integer level. Then, in order to get a good category of modules, we should restrict to, you know, um, yes, highest weight unitary representations. And I'm just wondering if there's you know some. Yeah, I guess if you, I mean, if you took, you know, sort of arbitrary modules, it's probably unwieldy, but you you clearly have some specific modules in mind. I was wondering if there's a mathematical character characterization of the modules of this vertex, this family of vertex operators that you're thinking about to get a nice fusion in, category. In case, I mean, I you're not going to have semi-simplicity. I, right? I, I could try to give the answer that Keiju would give. <laughs> So Kedro has, in a, in a sense, ad addressing this question in his last paper, because his his idea is to take the directions transverse to the brains and yeah. quantify them to three D. So he, he 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 likes to think about the this C times X geometry as a holomorphic topological theory in three D with infinitely many fields. Uh -huh. Now, if you do that, then then now you are getting your vertex algebra lives at the boundary of this holomorphic topological uh, theory in 3D. Now, test, that tells you the model of tensor category is not going to be the right words here because right. the bulk is holomorphic topology, but it's not topological. Right. So these right. kind of algebras are, are analogous to, to sort of Kasmudi at the, the critical level, which right. doesn't have a nice category of. Uh, oh, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. So, but I was wondering what. If there's still a good category of modules, uh, I don't know what the definition of good is. Yes. But, uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. That would be my problem too. I don't know what the well, it's it's whatever words you use to describe lines in this three-dimensional homomorphic topological theory. So it's gonna be a category. It's not monoidal because you cannot fuse lines. You don't have a transversal homomorphic direct topological direction, but it mm -hmm. has a, has a, it's a factorization category. You, uh -huh. if, you, if you give me a point Z and a point zero, I can find, I can tensor things at separate points, but I cannot bring them together uh, necessarily. So I don't know, somebody might know better than me what are the correct words to describe lines in a homomorphic topological list. Okay, thanks. But those will be the words. Any other questions for Davide? So let's thank him again. And um, The website says that the next talk is on December 11th, and it's by TBA. Does anybody know who TBA is? <laughs> well, I guess we'll find out next month. So thank you, everybody, and bye. Goodbye.